scripture reading this morning comes from the 28th chapter of Genesis, verses 10 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and went out for Haram. He reached a certain place and spent the night there. When the sun had set, he took one of the stones at that place and put it near his head. Then he lay down there. He dreamed and saw a raised staircase, its foundation on earth and its top touching the sky and God's messengers were ascending and descending on it. Suddenly, the Lord was standing on it and saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendant the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will become like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west, east, north, and south. Every family of earth will be blessed because of you and your descendants. I am with you now. I will protect you everywhere you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done everything that I promised you. When Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought to himself, the Lord is definitely in this place, but I didn't know it. He was terrified and thought, this, this sacred place is awesome. It's none other than God's house and the entrance to heaven. After Jacob got up early in the morning, he took the stone that he had put near his head, set it up as a sacred pillow, and poured oil on top of it. He named that sacred place Bethel, though Luz was the city's original name. Jacob made a solemn promise. If God is with me and protects me on this trip I am taking, and gives me bread to eat and clothes to wear, and I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I have set up as a sacred pillar will be God's house, and of everything you give me, I will give a tenth back to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be God. God. Thanks. I have been asked to fill the pulpit for Wainer for the last Sunday of the four months of summer, May, June, July, and August. I appreciate his asking me and I appreciate your willingness to listen to me. As I was thinking about those four summers and I have to say praying about them, I decided, or it was decided, that a thematic series of sermons would work. These four sermons will entail our talking about God, and in so doing, perhaps we can even learn to talk with God again. The sermon in the past May was entitled God's Concern. It dealt with us recognizing we are children of God and as such we have a responsibility as earthly parents are concerned for their children so too is God concerned for his. as we want to teach our children to accept responsibility, so does God want us to know we have responsibilities as well. This week, we look at God's persistence. If God needs us to fulfill his plan of sharing his love with the world, he will call us and persist until his will is accomplished. But rest assured, God never sends you out on a task without making sure you have or will have the skills necessary to accomplish the job. I have heard it said, and I caution us, that as God's children and Christians, if we say we have no talent, then we in essence are calling God a liar. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm sorry, chapter 12, 
Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given an ability as the Spirit of God chooses. Over the next two months, on the four Sundays, we will look at God's watchfulness. And then in August, we will be taking a look at God's love. These topics are definitely not all we need to know and understand about God, but are topics I feel we can never visit too often. The reading this morning of Jacob, who becomes the father of Israel, has within it many symbols of God's relationship with his children. The most beautiful to me is the ladder that he dreams about that ascends from heaven down to earth and his missionaries and angels are going up and down at a steady pace. It is as true for us today as it was for Jacob in his time. God is with us. God is constantly helping us. God sends his angels to aid us. Jacob goes on to become the father of Israel. Jacob, at this point, has not realized the mission God has for him, but does recognize God's presence with him at this point in time. So we're going to be talking about God's persistence when he invites us to come do things for him. We, myself included, like most people, want to run from that. We're scared. I don't know, God. I can't do that. I don't have the skills. I don't have the talents. I don't have the time to do what you're asking me to do. God is persistent. God simply waits for us to realize we truly don't have a choice. If we love God and if we believe ourselves to be children of God. The most memorable story in the Bible, I'm sure you remember, would be the story of Jonah. The story not only tells us of God's persistence, but has humor in it as well. Jonah tells God, I'm not going to Nineveh. God said, okay. Jonah says, I'm gonna run from you, God, and I'm gonna hide from you, God. God said, okay. And if you remember the story, we know what happens. Matters not where we go, God is there. It matters not what we deny, God's will will be done. Jonah tells God he is not going to Nineveh to preach to the people. We know that he did. Jonah is afraid the people will kill him. They don't. Jonah says the people will not repent. They do. God tells Jonah to tell the people that God will destroy them. God doesn't. God tells Jonah, you tell the people if they don't repent of their sins and turn back to me, I'm going to destroy them. 
So that's what Jonah does. The people, the Bible tells us, is from the king on down, repents in ashes. But then Jonah, and I have to wonder how many of us would do the same. Jonah tells the people, you've got to repent or God is going to destroy you. Then he goes up on the hillside and sits down to watch the destruction of this town. Did he not know that they were going to repent and that God was going to save them? When he realized God was not going to do this, guess what? Jonah got mad at God. So he's sitting up there in the hot sun, mad, pouting, and God watches him. God builds or has built a bush that comes up, shades Jonah from the sun. Jonah gets mad at God for doing that. Come on, God, let me sit here and let me roast and let me pout and let me do all of these things. God said no. But at the end of the story, this book in the Bible, God does tell Jonah of his willingness to forgive and his willingness to save his children. I did not ask for the Psalter reading this morning, but it was there. And I hope you will go home and think about that Psalter reading because it's very, very plain as the Psalms always are. Jonah seems to have forgotten that when he was asked to go to Nineveh to preach to the people, he defied God. He told God, I don't care who you are, I'm not going to do what you're telling me to do. And it is sad to say for me personally that sometimes in my life I have been in exactly the same place. God, I know you know everything, but you don't know this. God, I know that you can think that I can do this, but I don't have the skills necessary to do it. God says, yeah, you do. Yes, you will, and yeah, you do. So just as Jonah was forgiven for his disobedience, in his mind, he could not transfer that forgiveness for disobedience to the people of Nineveh. When he did finally what God asked him to do, the people of Nineveh were saved. Think about that. When Jonah finally did what God asked him to do, the people of Nineveh were saved. Surely, there is this lesson in that for us, for you and for me. And I believe very strongly that this story was preserved in the Bible, not just for its entertainment value, but for the lessons it holds. This lesson is easily compared to the sto uh, story of Jacob. God uses different methods to accomplish his will just as he did with Jacob and just as he's doing with Jonah. There is a United Methodist pastor who is now retired, but he's a, his name is Reverend Dr. James Moore. He was a pastor of a large church in Houston, Texas. And he wrote many books, about 40, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And writing about faith and writing about believing in God and writing about trusting in God and listening to God, he is one of my favorite authors. 
His books have served as an inspiration for me, and the titles alone catch my attention and cause me to want to read his books. Here are some of the titles of his books. When you are a, when you are a Christian, the whole world is from Missouri. Yes, Lord, I have sinned, but I have several excellent excuses. <laughs> Some folks feel the rain. Others just get wet. And then he wrote one that I really enjoyed, and it was called, When All Else Fails, Read the Instructions. In his book entitled, God Was Here and I Was Out to Lunch, Dr. Moore says, God comes near us, but we are so busy, so preoccupied, so set in our ways, so caught up in our own agenda that we don't recognize him. We don't recognize God. In our reading this morning, verse 16, Jacob says, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. This is the gate of heaven. How easy it is for us to recognize God in his house How easy it is to dismiss others who may think differently than we, who may look differently than we, whose troubles we may not even understand. You see, God's house is not just here. The world is God's house. The perceptions, my perceptions and understanding sometimes and too often become more important than God's perception and what God is trying to, to tell me. The psalmist also tell us, be still and know that I am God. But we step into our business each day forgetting to pray. We end our business each day, busyness each day, too tired to pray. I'll pray to God tomorrow morning twice. I'll pray to God tomorrow evening twice. But we're still not listening to God. In this book, Dr. Moore wrote, God was here and I was out to lunch. He tells this story. In heaven, a veteran angel was giving a new angel a tour. They were looking at all the beauties of the universe. The new angel, of course, was just awestruck with the beauty. The veteran angel says, come over here, I want to show you something. The veteran angel looks down in the Milky Way. The new angel says, my goodness, that's just beautiful. That is fantastic. The veteran angel says, yes, it is. That's God's handiwork. But I want you to look at something as we look at the Milky Way. I want you to look down. And I want you to look beyond all of this and see that small, tiny planet down there. The new angel says, yes, I see it. He said, that's Earth. The new angel says, wow, wow, 
I almost can't see it. It seems to be so insignificant. Veteran angel says, but it wasn't insignificant to God. What do you mean? You see, when the people on that little planet began to lose their way, when they began to place their ways before God's, and when they forgot to love as God taught them to love, God knew he had to make a presence on that small planet. So he sent his son. The new angel says, you mean God loves the universe and loves everything so much that he sent his son down to that little insignificant planet to help them find their way? The veteran angel said, yes, he did. The new angel says, God is awesome. God is awesome. I'm sure, I'm sure, I can feel it. I'm sure the people on that little planet rejoiced and began to have parties and celebrations and, and, and welcoming this God's son to that earth. The veteran angel says, one would think so, wouldn't they? But you know what? That was not the way it was. They killed him. You see, they were so caught up in their way. They were so caught up that they could not see a new way. They were so caught up they didn't even know God was there. And when God's son said, I am from God the Father in heaven, it just infuriated the people so badly, they tried to stone him. You see, sometimes we do the same thing. But God, if I support that ministry, it's going to take some of my money. But God, if I support that ministry, it's going to take my time. But God, I don't know how to garden. But God, I don't want to read to kids. But God, I don't want to share my food. I don't want to share my clothes. Be still, the Bible tells us and know that I am God. How many times have we gone to workshops or other places and we've been told you have to get outside yourself to understand? The problem is we don't even know what that means. We don't know how to get outside of ourselves, our selfishness, and our understandings, if other understandings don't help us, we ignore them. How many times have we been told, if you're going to come in to do this workshop or to do this work, you've got to leave your ego at the door? How many of us can honestly leave our egos at the door? How many of us even know what that means? How many of us have heard and understood the saying, let go and let God? Our need to control, our need to be in control is clasped in our fists So much, can't even pry your fingers off to let it go. Be still and know that I, not me, God, is God. Let God do his work and you will be simply amazed. So as we're here today, It is my prayer that I can know when God is trying to communicate with me and to listen. 
And my prayer today is the same for you. May God be blessed. Amen.